What up, y'all? I'm Dr. CBS here with my girl, Dr. Layla Brown, and you're tuned into this very special episode of The Last Dope Intellectual on the Black Pacific. All right, y'all. So for this week's very special episode, we have a very special guest, a friend, a colleague, um, and one of the best intellectuals we know, Dr. Keto Period. Swan. So we're going to dive into this very long and impressive bio. Mm -hmm. uh, Keto Swan is professor of African-American and African diaspora studies at Indiana University Bloomington. An award-winning historian of Black internationalism, Black power, and the Black Pacific, he is a scholar of race, public policy, and the African diaspora. He is the author of three major monographs, the first of which is Black Power in Bermuda, The Struggle for Decolonization, which came out in 2010, Paolo's Diaspora, Black Internationalism and Environmental Justice, which came out in 2020, and the forthcoming book, which we will discuss today, Pacifica Black, Oceania, Anti-Colonialism and the African World. Um, Paolo's Diaspora was awarded the African American Intellectual uh, History Association's 2021 Polly Murray Book Prize, and a National Endowment for the Humanities 2021 Fellowship Book Award Prize. Swan's next book project, as if he just had to be out here shitting on us all, um, Born as a Sufferer, The Insurgent Soundscapes of Dance Hall Music, which explores Black internationalism at the turn of the 21st century through reggae, dance hall, and sound system cultures. Swan's research has garnered several prestigious awards and grants, including fellowships from Harvard University's Radcliffe Institute, the American Council of Learned Societies, Australia University's, Australia's University of Queensland, Kenya's Jomo Kenyatta University of Technology, and the NEH. His public policy work included designing African studies curriculum for the Boston public school systems, new ethnic studies courses, conducting research on Black Boston's history of anti-police brutality activism, and the disproportionate spread of COVID-19 across Black communities in Boston and documenting Boston's Black radical tradition. In 2020, Swan served as an expert consultant for his home government of Bermuda's uh, Commission of Inquiry into Historic Land Grabs uh, in, in Bermuda. <coughs> where he gave evidence on the question of reparations for Black Bermudians who were displaced by the building of a U.S. base in Bermuda during World War II. So without further ado, please welcome our very special guest, Dr. Keto Swan. Keto, wait till y'all hear his voice, y'all. It's that deep baritone. Hey, Keto. I was thinking of keeping my microphone on mute because of that comment. <laughs> But I, I, All right, I Dr. Swan, but we can't hear Good morning. you. Thanks for having Good me. Thanks morning. for having me. Really great Thank to be you here. for being here. Okay, so we're just going to launch right in because we have so mm -hmm. much to talk with you about. And so I want to start <clears throat> just with thinking about the Black Pacific broadly. So there aren't that many scholars who work on the Black Pacific. Um, so some who immediately come to mind are Michael Gomez, the great Robbie Shilia, Katarina T Tiawa, Tiwa, I don't know how to pronounce her name exactly, Tewa. and Tewa, sorry, and her sister, the late, great Teresia Tewa. So you wrote, for example, in uh, your chapter toward the Black Pacific, Leo Hannett and Black Power in Papua New Guinea, in the forthcoming edited collection, Ideas in Unexpected Places, Reimagining Black Intellectual History, that, quote, in terms of scholarship, Oceania, uh, Oceania is arguably the African diaspora's most marginalized region. The complicated notion of a Black Pacific raises significant questions for the mainstream orientation of the diaspora as an Atlantic world experience, end quote. So can you just talk a bit about what exactly is Pacifica Black, as you call it, um, and which areas and peoples are included, and why has this region been understudied? And then, of course, uh, can you speak a little bit about what does the study of Black Pacifica add to uh, Black studies? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the first thing I'll say is, for me, scholars like Gerald Horn and his White Pacific, uh, I think, were really, really important. Uh, Tracy Bonavanu Amar's books on decolonization in the Pacific have been critical. Uh, Yesenia Barrigan has a book that looks at slavery in the Colombian Black Pacific Coast. So for me, I think, for my, my Black Pacific, um, if you think areas, it can vaguely or broadly includes Pacific waterways and land waves that it's connected to, so really broadly. So for example, uh, that could include, you know, experiences of Black people on the South American coast. Central American coast, 
for that regard, even the North American coast, California, for example, could be seen as a site of a black Pacific. Uh, you have engagement of Asia, which I think that's usually a really familiar, uh, you know, conceptual space when we think about Afro-Asia, we think about black engagements with China and Japan, boys and, and others, a lot of scholars, a lot of tension about that dynamic. We could think about connections directly between Africa uh, that crossed the Indian Ocean into the Pacific. Uh, my work looks at indigenous peoples in Oceania who were primarily racialized and colonized as being black and brown. So I'm specifically looking at Melanesia, uh, which is named Melanesia by European explorers because obviously they said phenotypically these persons look like Africa. So places like Papua New Guinea, named after, I guess, Old Guinea of East Africa, uh, the Solomon Islands, um, Fiji, Manawatu, New Caledonia, these make up what's generally now called Melanesia. Um, so that's the area I look at and specifically movements in Melanesia for decolonization and how they engage black internationalism in their political struggles. Uh, but this doesn't exclude movements that come out of what is now called Polynesia. So it includes Tahiti, a place that's colonized by the French. Uh, the West Papua is colonized by Indonesia after the Dutch. So for me, a Black Pacific allows us to engage other forms of colonialisms, the questions of environmental justice, uh, obviously, um, and many folks in the popular audience think of the Pacific and Blackness. They think about Aboriginal populations in Australia. Uh, so those political movements in Australia, or, or Black movements in Australia, are really important in my, in my work. But I just think, you know, broadly speaking, the Black Pacific is, is, could be a really broad unit that it extends far beyond even what I, what I, what I do. So why do you think that it ha hasn't re received as much um, attention? Do you think that it's the sort of Gilroy effect of like the, the Black um, Atlanticization of diaspora? Like what, why is it that we don't know very much about this region? Um, is it a language thing because of the hegemony of the English language or other European languages? Like what do you think has resulted in that, that um, marginalization? I, I think it's a lot, um, <clears throat> but I, you know, it's like there's fits and starts. There are these moments of heightened visibility. And then there are these moments of amnesia that take place. For example, Paulo's diaspora, uh, and I will talk about that a little later, but Paulo, an activist, Black power, Pan-Africanist from Bermuda, an environmental uh, engineer. He travels to Oceania. Uh, he's involved in Black power movements globally. Uh, in work, and he becomes a major conduit of a Black Pacific. So, for example, he launches the first international Black Power Conference in Bermuda in 1969. Uh, a broadcast is piped through to a group of Black Power Aboriginal activists in Melbourne, Australia, who they make connection with Paolo. He visits in 1969. He invites an Aboriginal or Black Australian delegation, I should say, to the Congress of African Peoples in Atlanta in 1970. And that capped are very visible, right? They make, they make presentations before the entire body. Uh, they meet folks in the Panther Party, Queen Oli Mother Moore. They spend time in Harlem. They visit Shinnecock reservations in New York. Uh, they travel into, to Michigan. They, they're very visible in terms of black spaces, particularly in New York in 1970. Um, at the Sixth Pan-African Congress, which take place, of course, we know in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania in 1974, Paulo invites a delegation from Wanawatu, uh, which was embroiled in a really vicious fight against British and French colonialism to Dar es Salaam. Uh, once again, these activists are really, you know, I mean, if you know anything about six pack, right? It's just, if you wanna have a, some type of grasp or at least grapple with the politics of the black world in the mid 1970s, I would say, just look at six pack, the arguments, the debates, the shenanigans, the alliances, the promises, the, the repression, the surveillance, the repression, that, the surveillance. Listen, the that order. six pack FBI file looked like a black phone book. All of those pages are redacted, but there's like thousands of pages. Anyway, my bad. It is, no, no, you're absolutely right. Um, and that's just the FBI files. Then you got the State Department files. 
Uh, you got CIA files. You got the files from the British government's files. You got the French government's files. The French are concerned that, you know, activists in Oceania are forming these dangerous liaisons with black power and Pan-Africanism. And so they monitor these activists once they leave. Uh, one of the more, for me, intriguing moments in the book was that one of the members of the delegation from Wanawatu disguised themselves, uh, but they claimed they were going to a World Council, World Council of Churches meeting in Tanzania called the Jama Safari, which was taking place at the same time as Six Pack. And they used that as a guise to get into Tanzania. Um, but while there, you know, they, they visited, um, you know, guerrilla camps, they met political leaders, and they made these major or critical alliances that helped them in the fight, which they eventually win against the French and the British. So for me, this also goes back to the question of what does the Black Pacific have to offer Black studies? Um, because much of the scholarship on six pack, right, ends in nothing happened. Negroes fought, Negroes came, <laughs> Negroes left, nothing happened. Uh, but if you look at it from the perspective of Black Pacific, something does happen. A like, six pack has a major impact on a revolutionary struggle in Oceania that actually has a big impact on other oceanic struggles as well. Uh, that's going to lead forward to FESTAC. Because once and FESTAC's another one of these major moments where you know there are fights, there are debates, there are issues, but there's also a major delegation from Papua New Guinea and Australia that are present, which signifies to the world that this is a black Papua New Guinea, it's a black country. If you look at Bob Marley's 1977 survival album, Papua New Guinea is the only country, the only flag. Uh, on the cover of the album. So the, the point is, there are these moments of really intense visibility. And then there's like this amnesia that takes place that we're still always trying to catch up with what we knew before, almost like from that one generation to another. So a lot that I talk about in the book, it's for me, you know, part of it is like a Sankofa process or return to the source. Um, if, if you're thinking of, of Cabral, right? We're, we're going back to think about how from people like Murs Tate, who was a professor of history, international studies at Howard. She probably wrote more about the Black Pacific in, in the 1940s and 50s than any other, any other scholar that I, I would know. Uh, you know, Renuka Rashidi, who recently passed away, uh, a lot of his work was based upon the work of folks like Paolo, uh, who were traveling to Oceania since the 60s. So there are these broader traditions. Um, the UNIA establishes a branch in Sydney in 1920. Uh, the Negro world is, is, you know, has a lot of material about these movements. So for me, the, the Black Pacific is, on one hand, how movements in Oceania look to the Black world in the struggles for decolonization, but also how did the architects of, of Pan-Africanism or Black nationalism see Oceania in the frame, as they frame the global discourses in ways. And the term Pacifica Black, Pacifica comes from, it's a Bislama term from Wanawatu that means Pacifica in the Creolized language called, called Bislam. Okay, so you've already started telling us a little bit about Paolo, um, but one of the other critical interventions of that book was, was that you utilize um, Paolo's story to help us think about work of environmental justice mm -hmm. across the African diaspora. And you talk about one of his proposals um, that he put forth to develop a formal method of gathering and codifying intelligence about the production and distribution of precious ores and metals across the diasporic world. Um, you also mentioned that in his proposal, um, he addressed issues around food security, rising population, sustainable housing, critical advances in technology, and even reclaiming the Sahara. So could you give us a little bit more of a sense of who Paulu was? How did you first encounter him and his work? Uh, why did you decide to dedicate a book's link, a monograph to his life and the work that he's done? Um, and how does his legacy help us think specifically about environmentalism as Black African diasporic people? It, that's, that's a great question. I'll be as succinct as possible. Uh, I meet Paulu just after undergrad. I was sitting. I remember the day I'm sitting off Reed and Rasta and Resistance, that brilliant ice cream and gold cover. Uh, and I got a phone call from a former Black Power activist named Michelle Caldoun, who was a leader in Bermuda's Black Ray Cadre. She says, you need to come meet somebody on Saturday. I said, what do you mean? I got a million dollars? <laughs> or he got, he got the massacre to, to decolonization like or something? Because I'm just pissed off. You know, I'm just, I'm in Bermuda, right? I've graduated with a degree in engineering. 
but Bermuda's still a colony. I don't know what to do next. I have a degree, I have a degree in computer science, but I want to work construction because I'm I'm just fed up. I don't know what do I do I walk through the streets of Bobby Land? Like what's the road for me? Is it front street? What do I do? Like what's what's the what's the purpose? And where does Bermuda fit in this world of black radicalism? Because I've read the neighbor of North Carolina. See, I'm gonna be polite. Yes, and yeah, I'll just say yes, yes, a a, a cordial neighbor. Of North and South Carolina, very beloved neighbor. I'm, I'm gonna keep it, keep it polite, keep it very polite. I'll be sure the same hurricanes. How about that? Be sure the same hurricanes. Um, so I, I go to this 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 home and I meet Paolo, and I you know he just he just blew me away because and I, I say Rasta resistance, but I mean that right. You know, I'm reading about Rodney. And I, you know, being a young person, I try to test them a little bit. But I read and reading about this dude named Rodney, you know what I mean, from Guyana, which I know about him. And he knows Rodney. So yeah, I knew Rodney in Tanzania, blah, 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 blah. So I said, hmm, well, that didn't work. I'm taking out a shot. And we'll holler, let, me, let me shoot like a little CLR James. Yeah, let's see what he can do about that. See, I had a little James. Yeah, I knew James when I was a child, you know, he was my mentor. I was his bodyguard. We worked together, boom, boom, boom. I quickly realized that this brother is informed in these global movements beyond just the academic sense. Uh, when I mentioned, oh, what, what do you know about black folks in Australia? And he, at the time, I don't, I don't know who he is, right? I have no, there's no memory on, there's no conception that he has literally traveled the world as a black power activist, environmental engineer. I have no sense of that. Um, but we hit it off. I spent a lot of time with him. Um, you know, driving around the island and he would just stop and say, hey, that used to be a UNIA bakery right there. You know, those type of like real integral conversations. So eventually I'm like, well, you know what? I'll do a master's thesis on the UNIA and then I'm gonna come back and do Black Power and I wanna interview you and you be a part. And, be, and so we really, really hit it, hit it off. Um, he would show up in DC at all these strange moments. Be like, hey, I'm here. I wanna come to class. No, what do you mean to come to class? I want to come to your class. What are you doing in class today? Oh, we're talking about Robert F. Williams. You know, I'm, you know, I'm trying to give him a little Robert. He's like, oh yeah, I know Robert Williams. We helped him get his lawyer when he came back to the United States. Like, dang, man, come on. Like, can I have a little something? So he comes class and he's quiet. He, he, he was very quiet. And we're in class and it's like, I'm, I'm nudging him, like saying, why don't you say something? Like, you, you know Robert Williams. Like, why are you... Why are you being quiet in class? So eventually he speaks up and then it's, it's a lesson. And then he says, I need to drop, you need to drop me off somewhere. Uh, it's Sylvia Hill, who Sylvia Hill, you know, major, major activist, um, South African, um, and so sort of anti-apartheid, um, I'm butchering the title right now. Um, Layla's gonna chastise me for that. But either way, I meet, through Paulo, I also meet an amazing network of Pan-Africanists, leaders that I don't know. Um, so that's how I meet Paulo. And he told me tons of stories and writing this book that took me probably at least 10 years. It was heartfelt to relive some of the moments that I thought were just exaggerated stories that were really real. This, this dude, there's really thousands of FBI documents of surveillance on him. He's deported from several countries because of his involvement in that entire colonial movements including um, Wanawatu. Um, and so the story is about unpacking his movements, but also his life, but also the movements that he was connected to, which I think you know was even more important than just this big man kind of story. I was really keen about the movements and how this, the scope of environmental justice and how the long-standing process and what it means in different places. In Oceania, it's about anti-nuclear testing. Uh, it's it's, it's anti-mining. Uh, it takes these different forms. Uh, I mentioned the hurricanes, but that's a real, that's a, that's a real phenomenon, a real critical, not only um, environmental issue, but also social and political issue, particularly in the Caribbean. And so what I wanted to follow up and ask, so mm -hmm. what does, what does the work that he specifically did in thinking about environmentalism 
through through the African diaspora, but also particularly through the through the Black Pacific, help us. How does that help us think differently about maybe what our responsibilities are, what some of the possibilities are, in thinking about environmental change um, and what it actually means to live and with a different type of relationship towards the earth than the ones that we have. Let me just we're, we're, add on to that. Let me just add on to that. And then how does he help us decenter? Because oftentimes when we think about environmentalism or ecological justice, it's white folks because they fucking right. monopolize everything. So how does centering Paulo and other activists like him help us to decolonize <laughs> environmentalism? Well, and this is this is also why six pack is important. Uh, because of Paulo's insistence, one of its agendas was around science and technology. And one of his main goals was supposed to be the creation of a, a Pan-African Science and Technology Center that was gonna be based in Africa, that was gonna be coordinated by a global team of black Pan-Africanist scientists and engineers who would collectively work together to think about the environmental issues impacting the black world and solutions. That was the, that was the plan. This is 1974. This was the plan. Um, but for some reason, when scholars have written about six pack, the science and technology part is just invisibilized. It's not, it's not part of the discussions. It's is it communism or capitalism, right? It's that's that's the that's kind of the framing of the debates that six pack is remembered by. Um, but the science part is, is really critical. So one of the connections they made, um, and when I say they, I mean Paulu and other political engineers, was that environmental issues were connected with slavery, the land of slave trade and colonialism. Uh, these questions are being raised now, but they're raising these questions back then and they're saying, so also if we think of reparations, reparations should include ecological, there should be ecological measures as well. Uh, that, that, that's a part of it. Um, so for example, if you look at the spread of the desert or desertification, particularly in, 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 in West Africa, uh, and connection to slavery is questions like if you take millions of, of primarily farmers or, or, or young, young thinkers and, and workers from agricultural spaces, what does it do to the land? If the land's not being tilled, the desert will grow. This is an argument they were making. So therefore, if you want to talk about reparations, we should talk about the Atlanta slave trade's impact on Africa from an ecological standpoint and position. Uh, those type of questions. Um, he was raised in a Bermuda that is still very much, it's still an ecological paradise, um, you know, but not, not in the sustainable ways that I was privy to and that other generations were. Uh, but Bermuda is a place where the rain is still collected from the, from the rain, the, the, the water is still collected from rain. Uh, houses are built with uh, limestone roofs. The earth itself is very much limestone. Bermuda is based upon a, on a volcano. Um, so that the same, the same rocks are used in the roofs that they, they purify the water from the rain, which goes into water tanks. And that's our primary water source. There's no central water system. Um, Bermuda's homes are also built to deal with the yearly visit of hurricanes. So Paulo grows up in an environment, his father is a, is, is a laborer, is a mason. So he grows up working in quarry. So he also has the sense of, of the connection between labor, land and the environment. And so he takes that with him. So, you know, across the world um, in Liberia and then in Kenya and then in, in Oceania, he's designing water tanks from bamboo that are sustainable. Uh, homes made from bamboo or homes rather that are sustainable. And, and the argument was we should build sustainable homes to address colonialism. Colonialism has taken our, not only just our resources, but our knowledge of our skill sets. So if we can teach ourselves how to build homes and how to have fresh water supplies, we're already addressing a critical issue. Uh, that's a legacy of colonialism. But he, his, he used innovations that he took from the lessons he learned in Bermuda and methods he learned, and he, he just incorporated them with other lessons or tools he learned from other communities, uh, which becomes the final product is like this indigenous way of freedom or decolonization around technology and not just statements about, about the system, but truly decolonizing um, you know, countries from an energy standpoint, renewable energy and sustainable development standpoint. This was his, his major contribution.
And I'll be honest, in this book, I probably only address, you know, that dynamic in terms of, it's, it's fragmented because he wrote tons of manuals and plans uh, that are still, I, I, I really don't engage that, that thoroughly at all. It's so interesting because everything you were saying not only helps to sort of reframe environmentalism, but also STEM, this push towards STEM. Right. And it's highly fucking neoliberalized, identity reductionist framework, right? But right. Mm -hmm. Paulu shows how science and technology and engineering is very much a de can be very much a decolonial project and one that is for that is attuned to and articulated to environmental concerns. So that's really interesting. But Sharice, um, I just want to say that that's please. it. That is exactly what you said is exactly it. What he did for me, because I was I was pushing back from science and STEM once I graduate. Mm -hmm. He shows up and says, wait a minute, hold up. That's not that's not it. Like, look at this whole other world. So you're absolutely right. That's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. And we need we need scientists and engineers in the revolution right after the struggle we need people to build shit right and so i think that that's the importance of the quote unquote hum humanities decolonized humanities this type of critical thinking work because otherwise you get fucking ben carson people who have technical skills and no sense of anything right um but then on the other hand you have all of us who have these amazing critiques but i ain't got no fucking skills i can't build shit i don't know you know what i mean and so like i will die <laughs> after the revolution and so i think that is very important um Okay, so it wouldn't be me if I didn't ask a highly academic question. So let's get it. All right. So in your latest work, uh, Pacifica Black Oceania, Anti-Colonialism mm -hmm. in the African World, I wanted to state the whole title so people can find it. It's going to drop in spring 2022, right? Indeed. Okay, so you write, quote, Pacifica Black is less concerned about challenging a, a, the limitations of a Black Atlantic framework as it is about approaching the Pacific via the lens of African diaspora studies and Black intellectual history. It is written in, in concert with critical studies on race and decolonization in 20th century um, Oceania, end quote. So we've had a discussion about the term diaspora um, as opposed to say pan-Africanism um, or black internationalism. And then throughout my dissertation, I have a whole critique about African diaspora studies um, and how it operated, how African diaspora operated epistemologically in black studies since the 1990s, specifically the way it became conflated with, uh, with not only Atlantic studies, but also overdetermined by cultural, by culture or culturalism and abstracted from a sort of political economy reality. So I just wonder, can you talk about the work that diaspora does for you in your study of the Black Pacific, as opposed to maybe other conceptual frameworks, although I do think you use internationalism and, and pan-Africanism also, um, but I'm sure you don't understand them as interchangeable. But then also, we had a conversation with Hakeem Adib last season about his mm. preference for pan-Africanism versus Black internationalism. So he think Black academic, U.S. Black academics just made that shit up, right? Because it's not, in terms of the, archi the archive, it's not there but maybe it is in the Black Pacific archive. I don't know. So I'm just wondering, sort of like, what it, where do you weigh in <laughs> on Pan-Africanism, Black internationalism, and African diaspora? Um, and how do you distinguish between these um, in, your, in your own work? Um, well, that's a lot. Um, but it's funny. It's funny, right? Um, you know, I'm, Layla mentioned in my next book is, is Born as a Sufferer. She do a little shade, but that's all right. Uh, born as a sufferer, which was looking at Black insurgency at the turn of the 20th century, but through sound system culture, reggae and dance. So, so I was literally listening to a Sizzler Kalanji song today called Define Yourself. And he starts a song by saying, I'm a Black international. I guess how he starts, that's how he starts the song. He says, repatriation, um, black, black, freedoms, black Freedoms, Black International. And so it's just funny how, you know, what, what are the archives, right? What, 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 which archives, like which, which soundscapes? Um, in the, excuse me for being in a sound, sound system mindset, but one of my most beloved songs growing up in Bruno was Root Boy International. Um, one of the songs we follow, Eddie's International, Eddie's as in King Eddie's, as in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, International, one of the biggest reggae songs that come out of, out of New York in the 80s, 90s. Um, and also, you know, in Bermuda, there was this amazing rack store called Dub City International, which is where, you know, we brought all our reggae cassette tapes uh, from across the world. So for me, you know, I, I've, 
in my archive, international shows up, uh, or, or black and national as, as a dean shows up pretty consistently. Um, but I don't want to stray from the from the broader questions. I think the terms have use in different spaces, but I understand the debate. I understand there's some some hesitancy around or at least some questions of the scholars who want to use black internationalism, right? Are they are they using it because they think there's less political bite than pan-Africanism? Um, but from from my standpoint, you know, I, I just don't I don't really feel I should need to defend the use of a term produced by anti-colonial black woman non-anglophone from Martinique as in Janet Nadal, Paulette Nadal, forerunner of the negritude movement who are calling for the rise of movements of, of, of black uh, artists across, across the world. I don't, I don't really you know, feel the need to really defend my use of, of, of black international because I think that opens up, by using that term, opens up those questions of gender, it opens up those questions of language, it opens up questions of art, it opens up questions of what are the archives? What's le what's a legit archive and what's not? So, but I think it's a great you know, great debate to have. For me, yeah, I, I, I would and I, I would agree with you about the '90s um, because my my take I think on the diaspora, African diaspora, is also response to I think what happens in the '90s. Um, you know, I was very much a student of Joseph E. Harris. You know, I, I watched him in practice, um, and being a student of Harris. You know, I'm present when Harris is, by the 90s, Harris is working with, uh, he has a project called the South African Research and Archival Project, where he's documenting African-Americans' involvement in anti-apartheid movement. And so his turn, his diaspora studies is bringing activists, including from South Africa, on Howard's campus, literally on a weekly basis and conducting extensive interviews um, with all these activists, including grad students, and so the way it worked, we would read up on the activists and be present in the interviews. Uh, there being primary documents uh, that were going to Morning Spring On. You know, we hail Morning Spring On. I don't think we talk about the process enough or what makes Morning Spring On, Morning Spring On. Uh, Trans Africa, for example, gives its papers to James Early um, to Morning Spring On, but that's because of Harris. And that, that's because of the decades of work that he did, not only as a scholar, but a scholar who was connected with freedom struggles across the black world. I'm not talking since the 1960s. Um, so in the 1960s, African diaspora studies, you know, the, the first panel takes place at an international conference, an Africa conference in Tanzania. Uh, so it's centered around African freedom struggles. Some of these debates include Walter Rodney. Harris was always Pan-African. Uh, Harris's first book was about Black populations in the Middle East, like that's his first book, is not about the Atlantic, right? His first book is about the Middle East. So from its inception, it's about also looking, it's global. It's also looking east of Africa. Um, so by the time he hit the 90s, you know, to push you to the Black Atlantic, I think it takes away from what Diaspora Studies was. I don't think Diaspora Studies since then has been what it was, you know, I guess, in, inclined to be. Uh, so for me, what I'm calling for is a return to a source in some ways to engage some of those connections that diaspora studies had with political struggle, with Pan-Africanism in the 60s and 70s that by the 90s and 2000s, we probably can't recognize when we look at the canon of African diaspora studies. So it's really my concern with, you know, um, with what African diaspora studies was in the, in the long vision, as opposed to what it had been. Um, to look at Harris, now we're looking at what Howard looks like. Um, and not just Howard from, you know, from a celebratory standpoint, right? Black excellence. Well, right, exactly. But Alpheus Hutton is at Howard uh, in political Dr. science. Dr. Wilkerson too, I they know. Catch hell. Right, exactly, and, and they catch hell, right? There's a lot of folks at Howard who catch hell. There's a, there's a space of black radicalism at Howard. Uh, Kwame Ture, for example, and we could, we could, we, you know, we, we know that narrative, right? There's a lot there, so for me, when we when we deny African diaspora studies that uh, the physical space of where it's conceived, I think we miss a lot. We miss Morris Tate, who was Harris's undergraduate teacher, and they shared an office. So once again, I mentioned Morris Tate as someone who emphasizes the Black Pacific. She has an involvement on how Harris conceptualized African diaspora studies. So I think for me, that's the work that diaspora does. Uh, and Harris quickly 
from the first conference in Tanzania. They had meetings in Colombia. Now, maybe maybe popular now, and I'm saying that in quotes because it's not really it's not really the right word to talk about these black populations. Uh, but but this is something that comes with Layla's work. These connections and looking at black Pacific or black populations in Colombia and Venezuela. Harris is part of some of these conversations in the 70s. Um, and diaspora is being used in some of these political movements in spaces that I found you know, to be really interesting. Um, and also there's another major conference in, Ken in Kenya that produces um, the global dimension of the African diaspora. Uh, that has an, a really, really long chapter by St. Clair Drake about Pan-Africanism, but it's, it's, it's a resource. So, but to your point, by the 90s, something else, something else takes place with African diaspora studies that I was actually trying to push back against um, as a scholar who is really concerned about the Pan-Africanist elements of diaspora studies. And that's what attracted me to diaspora studies in the first place. Well, I think it might be the second is issue of global dimensions. So like my PhD is in African diaspora studies. So we read all this diaspora stuff, right? So I think it's the second edition, the blue one of global dimensions of the African diaspora, Tony Martin, has a very interesting critique of diaspora in that 80s moment where because of the the Jewish parallel mm -hmm. right and I mm -hmm. think and because of his extensive work on Garveyism he really pushes back in that moment on diaspora so I just do you know what I'm talking, I just wonder what you make oh, of scattered, that. Scattered, that scattered Africa scattered Africa yeah because that yeah. came out of that comp that came out of a diaspora conference at Howard right that collection and so I just wonder what your thoughts are on that as somebody who does Garvey Garvey who does Garveyism studies but also diaspora I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> you know, I, I love Tony Martin, but I, I think I think the what's important to me is like what the space creates. It creates the space to have those kind of debates. And what does it mean for someone like Harris to actually include, and not just Harris, but as the the architect of the space to include that essay, which you know one can see is the most is the most challenging critique of the whole battle day. rap. But yeah, exactly, right? But yet there's some space for that. Um, I saw relevance in it, but I think we're gonna struggle with these terms, right? We're, we're gonna struggle with these terms. There's a scholar, former scholar Howard, um, uh, oh man, um, Suleiman Yang, um, African studies out of Senegal. He used to, <laughs> that's brilliant dude. Uh, one of his, phrases was concepts are like baskets you have to fill them up to make them heavy and that has really carried me for so many years you have to fill them up to make them heavy so what's in a concept it's like we could we could radicalize or de-radicalize concepts like what do we fill them up with and it's, it's not that you know i think african diaspora is the most perfect term to describe the black world it's not but then where do we go and, and do we stay in English to have these discussions about decolonization? No, it's tough. You can. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't even, you can't even begin to stay there. So I guess then I wouldn't be me if I didn't ask the question about the women. Um, so in the chapter on Pacifica Black that explores the life and work of Uluru Nunakal, you explain that drawn to the Communist Party of Australia's open critiques of Australia's exploitation of Aboriginal communities, um, that she then, uh, even though she joined the party because of that, she then le later leaves due to racism that she experiences inside the party, a story we know all too well. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about who Nunakal is, um, more about her engagements and struggles with the Communist Party of Australia, um, and then how her time in the CPA shaped her radical politics even after her departure? And then perhaps more broadly, how do figures like her help you and us think through questions about gender um, throughout your work? And does a focus on the Black Pacific offer a new way of understanding the gendered nature of anti-colonial struggles? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, Nunu Cow is, 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 is amazing. Uh, honestly, for me, you know, she's the kind of, of, of Black activist that once you know her name, in her work, you 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 can't really put her down. Like, you just you just can't. She's born in 1920. Um, you know, her totem is the carpet snake. Uh, she grows up, you know, having a sense of herself as an indigenous woman, a girl, 
who becomes a woman. Um, she's already politicized by the time she joins the Communist Party. Um, she, she joins World War II. Uh, and she, um, this is where she first starts to engage African-American soldiers. It's just like a, um, I mean, she doesn't fight in combat, um, but she leaves that moment having a sense of there's, there's a black world, but also by that time in Australia, there's a large population of, of uh, Melanesians who were forcibly taken to Australia in the 19th century known as South Sea Islanders now. But the process is called black burden. This was a forced labor system uh, that, that, that brought um, over 70,000 individuals um, to Australia. And then they were deported in 1901 when Australia decides to be a white, white country um, as an independent nation. But a number of those persons stay. Uh, one of those persons, uh, her father, uh, well, Faith Bandler is the name, uh, her father, was one of those persons, Black Bird, she becomes really close friends with Nuna Cal. And so her politicization is not just about an Aboriginal Australian, but the understanding of there are Black, other Black people in Australia too. Um, and the Communist Party, you know, the Communist Party was racist on, on a personal level, right? That's, that's no surprise. But one of the things the Communist Party did, it focused a lot on um, Aboriginal struggles in Oceania. So his materials, his, his papers, his pamphlets are full of content about these political movements. Uh, it looks like the Communist Party of Australia took the common terms meetings in the early 1920s seriously. And so there's a lot of engagement about indigenous populations, the right to self-determination um, in Australia and in the Pacific Islands. But on a personal level, these are white Australians uh, who still carry the baggage of racism and so Faith Bandler also joins the Communist Party, but a number of Aboriginals do. Uh, but you know, she leaves with the distrust that she had when she enters. She never has a has a real trust of yes, and the Negro question exactly. Um, sorry, she never has a trust of of white liberals, who she calls white do-gooders. But in a context where you know Indigenous Aborigines have been brutally almost exterminated, there's a ton of these organizations that are around Aboriginals that are run by white do-gooders. And so she's forced to interact consistently. She's forced to be in spaces that she doesn't necessarily want to be in because of political expediency. She can't get blacker than that, right? If you think about <laughs> where we find ourselves, that's, that's a black story. Um, eventually she joins a group called the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aboriginal um, and Torres Strait Islanders who were ethnic groups of North Australia, who culturally are probably closer to Papua New Guinea. I mean, Australia is vast, right? So talking tons of ethnic groups um, in indigenous societies. So for Katsi is national. She's the, the secretary for Queensland. And she's just amazing. I mean, she has like this amazing wit. She can out talk anybody in any room. It doesn't matter who. Like she's just, you don't want to see on the mic. Like you don't, you don't want to, mm -mm. <laughs> no, no, not, not this sister. She's a poet. Uh, her first poem is, um, is about her son, Dennis Walker, who actually is going to found the Black Panther Party of Australia in 1970. That just tell us a lot about, his politics tell us a lot about where she was coming from. Uh, she's always a socialist. That, that, that's very, very, very consistent. Uh, and her son as well. That's that's very that's very consistent, and they work with the party consistently. Uh, you know, members of the party are never not there. Once again, maybe in terms of literature, uh, and magazines, and news from from I guess the, the white middle class, or white liberals in Australia, rather, Communist Party has the most the most thought provoking, most accurate content. It's not it's not it's not a it's not a question at all. I think that I don't think that story has been totally, totally unpacked either. Um, but not just for Australia, but also for Black Indigenous movements in general. In other words, the Negro world, when the Negro world is covering um, <clears throat> violence against Black people in Papua New Guinea, they're often reading through the papers of the Communist Party in Australia, and they end up in the Negro world. Yes, if you ask to see you. Um, but that being said, um, she eventually leaves for Katsi because of white do-gooders. 
1969, when the Black Power movement is, 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 is on a rise, she makes this amazing speech that inspires a ton of younger activists. She says, when you leave this conference and you go back to the rat holes you call home, come out fighting. And then she goes to the World Contra Churches meeting in London, uh, where she stays after that. And she, you know, goes to protests and she comes back and writes this report about how, you know, all these amazing black rays in London and the black mass is about to rise up. Uh, there's going to be a race war. Uh, China uh, is going to come inside of Africa and the black world against Europe and Australia. And Australia doesn't get itself together. There's going to be a race war. So they got 10 years because uh, we coming. And I'm not a Black Panther, but they coming. So, you know, I'm trying to keep them in check, but look, you don't, your white do gooders don't go do something, it's gonna be your fault because it's your, it's your white violence that's creating all the violence you say we're gonna do, you create it. She's very clear about white violence. Um, she's not, she becomes a very much a supporter of black power, although there are also personal tensions with her son that are also wrapped up. But in a very dramatic moment, um, she ends up on the Stern Committee for the Australian delegation to FESTEC. And in the mid 1970s, on her way back from Nigeria, she's on a plane that's hijacked in Dubai by a Palestinian organization. And she's woken up on the tarmac to a rifle in front of her. And she describes it as a tall, handsome, dark skinned man. And she says, What's going on? Are we being hijacked? Like, yes. And she's like, Oh, you know what? I know your Palestinian struggle. You know, like we supported your struggle. I'm, I'm Aboriginal from Australia. They're like, who, bro? You're not Pakistani? So I know I'm Aboriginal from Australia, and I think you should join Festac. Now, mind you, this is this is guns are out. Oh, you're saying Some, this is with a gun in her face? Yeah. <laughs> she like, oh Festac. shit, word. <laughs> I was gonna She's ask you Festac. about this, and and this interesting way that I think the struggle over Palestine keeps coming up in black radical struggles and right. how important it is. But anyway, not to, not to interrupt you. No, no, but I think, I think that's it, right? She, she never, she doesn't denounce. She just says, I don't, I don't approve of your method. You should join Festac. And she writes this poem. Um, but wait, can I ask the question? The so, disapproval of the method, did she really have a, I mean, I, you may not know the answer to this, but because I, when I was reading that in the introduction of the chapter, did she really have a issue with the tactic of hijacking a plane or did she have an issue with being on a plane that was being hijacked? Because I, I was like, those are two different things. <laughs> I, was, yes. I would say the latter, I would say the latter, yes. Uh, but let me put it this way, she never, She's, she's called on publicly to denounce what they did. And she never does. That's really what I'm saying. She never, she never denounces hijack. So to your point, she, she never denounces herself being caught. She, she just never, she says Yusef was a pediatrician and he was forced to be, take up a rifle when he should be holding a young woman in his bosom under the moonlight. I think she, you know, well, she writes this literally as a poem called To Yousef, My Son, on the plane, on a sick bag. And it's just remarkable to me. So it's just called on later to come on and denounce, you know, this hijack. It's just like, if you were, weren't enacting apartheid, Palestine, look how many folks you killed. And what's striking was also what she does critique is that. A negotiation is made via Libya. Um, uh, she's dropped off in Tunis, and she notes that she's she's driven she's driven off the tarmac in a Black Maria police vehicle, which is the same vehicle that is being used to arrest Aborigines. Like that's what she denounces. She denounces <laughs> being put in this Black Maria vehicle that's taken up from the plane, much less than. Being on the plane, it's it you know the, the act itself, um, and so I just thought that was that was really that was really really striking. It says a lot about her agenda diplomacy, and who she really was. Like in the face of like you know overt pressure, she just would rise to the occasion. That's why I have you know I'm I'm a fan. That's Nunu Kai. Interesting. Okay, so. 
I have many thoughts about about that whole thing, but I'm gonna move on. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about Garvey's and black and black power. I'm really intrigued. It's interesting, and this is apropos of nothing, but like I've been getting a lot. I wouldn't say a lot, but a little bit of smoke on Twitter because I've been posting a lot about mm. Garvey. I'm writing about Garvey in my book, specifically how even though he was anti-communist at a particular, especially late, especially after 1921, he was still subjected to the the Red Scare alongside the Black Scare. And so I'm just reading a lot about Garvey, and people are like, "You like Garvey? Like Garvey was?" And it's like Garvey took. If we believe Bobby Hill, he did take a rightward turn, but it's motherfucking Marcus Garvey. And if you love black people and you know his influence on people from Kwame Nkrumah to Malcolm X to um, the black Pacific, because I'm about to get into in a moment. It's like, let's like, let's, you know, anyway. So, so I'm, I'm thinking a lot about, about Garvey and, and just the, the expanse of Garveyism and how it, it, you know, transformed into other types of, of, of movement. So, okay. Like, so you demonstrated in your 10, 2010 book, Black Power in Bermuda, The Struggle in Decolonization. Your articles, Bermuda Looks to the East, Marcus Garvey, the UNIA in Bermuda, 1920 to 1931. And another article, Caveats of an Obnoxious Slave, Blueprints for Decolonizing Black Power Studies from the Intellectual Governors of White Supremacy. And then the chapter I mentioned earlier, Toward a Black Pacific, um, among many others, how Garveyism um, and Black power have had a particular resonance in the Black Pacific. And I just wanted to know, like, why has this been the case? Like, why those movements in particular alongside Pan-Africanism? And then... How might a better understanding of the practical and real world applications of Black mm. power in the mm. Pacific and elsewhere challenge the academic distortions that pervade so called Black power studies that apparently people, somebody invented in like 2002? But anyway. <laughs> wow. Um, Garvey, okay, Garvey. The, the, the thing about Garvey is that, you know, I think Garvey's, okay, so the calls are back to Africa, right? Garvey doesn't create that, right? You could think of, you know, Paul Coffey, um, you know, a, a church around Africa, with the African Methodist Episcopal Church is there already, there are Black newspapers, uh, concept of Black nationhood, um, Black folks are already looking for Africa in the Bible in Ethiopia. I think Garver's genius is that he's able to put all these different streams of black consciousness into one organization. I think that's what makes him a genius and there's also his organizational structure. And also the fact that I think, you know, we don't talk enough, the UNIA is founded with, you know, Amy Ashwood Garvey from its inception. It's not just Marcus. Um, I think they tapped into where the black world really was. The, the organizational structure, a lot of the leaders were already black leaders in their spaces. Uh, the UNIA gave them a platform or a broader, a broader space to work. And for me, I think that's it. Um, Garvey catches, Garveyism catches fire in port cities. So for example, Sydney, when, when the UNIA branch is formed in Sydney, it's already a, a population that includes African-Americans, um, Caribbean, African sailors, Aboriginal sailors. Um, and this is a long tradition. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, a brother who shows up in <laughs> Australian lore known as Black Caesar. Um, Black Caesar might have been his haircut. I don't know. I don't think that was a style yet. Um, but he either came from Mozambique <laughs> or Madagascar, rather. Or, or, or Barbados and his is sent to Australia as a convict and he becomes the first, you know, the, the first, um, first convict to escape, the first bush ranger. And he clashes with other indigenous groups. Um, but my point is there's this, there's this long, long relationships, a long presence of, of different kinds of black people uh, finding themselves in similar spaces like Sydney. Uh, you know, the organizer of the Sydney branch had already had a group called the, the, the Congress of the Color People's Association in Sydney. They do parties, social events. I got chastised in the media. Um, and Jack Johnson wins his heavyweight title fight in Australia. They do parties for Jack Johnson. 
So they have, you know, they have some type of social life and then they form a United chapter. It's like, these are the same folks, which Gov is always connected into the cultural space of black communities and the church spaces. They, the United can speak the language of these various communities and they're talking about land and trade. Uh, I think one of the other reasons why Garvey survives is, is, is really through, through popular culture. And I think, you know, my, my, my next project, um, you know, you can't you can look at sound system culture, not see Garvey. That's where I first really learned about Martin Garvey is through reggae. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think that's, that will stop anytime soon. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think you, you know, I don't think our studies on Garvey have been exhausted at all. I'm unpacking this song by this artist named Dillinger, who in 1975 has a song called Out of Garvey's Pistol. And the song basically is about, uh, it's what the lyric says, I mean, I don't know about how you listen to the audience, but I feel about all these type of things, but the lyrics say, Out of Garvey's Pistol, Bagawaya gets shot. Matthew fall on a death trap. And Bagawaya is the, you know, the anthropological, imagine, um, betrayer of Marcus Garvey, the FBI informant. Uh, shows up in reggae music as Bag of Wire in the 1970s. I frankly think it's Bugs and Wires is in terms of the type of surveillance, but I could be wrong. That's just my, that's my perspective. But I think Garvey, if we want to understand the surveillance of Black people um, across the 20th century, Garvey is critical. And I, I, yeah, to your point, I think you're absolutely right about how, you know, Garvey not being part of the Communist Party doesn't mean he doesn't get impacted by the red scare. That's that's I think that's for me that that that's clear. But I also think that when we think of the UNIA, it's not just Garvey. I mean, even you know, even for the, the personal pitfalls of Garvey, we're talking about an organization that had if maybe it didn't have the two million that Garvey says, but there are certainly hundreds of thousands of, of individuals and leaders across the black world. We can't discount you know, their reasons or their legacies, which is why, uh, it, to me, it makes sense. It's almost like saying, you know, I, well, I don't know if y'all, back in the day when we would say, oh, you know, you know, there are black folks in the Bible. And then you look for, you want to look for a black person, look for a black person. And you're like, wait a minute, it's, it's Africa. Like, why are you looking for like one or two black folks? Like, where you, <laughs> like, like, look where it is. If, if Garvey is, has millions of members, if the UNIA is so big, the real question would be what organization is not influenced by UNIA? Like not the other way wrong. It's like, we're still trying to find, oh, this one was part of UNIA because they said it in the document. But who would the UNIA not influence? Even the Communist so Party, okay? Exactly. Part of the reason why they had to take the, the Negro question seriously and really center at least for a particular historical moment like black workers is because of the ubiquity of garvey this is why they spend so much time dragging him listen they spent a lot of time dragging garvey and not in the sort of phenotypical way that the boys and mother folks do but they really they really come for him because i mean i think that they do think that he's unscrupulous which people do with that what they may but i think it's also be but they they literally had to contend with his methodology of organizing and of influencing black people period right. and so it's like say what you want about the individual but like he was making moves and he was doing things period this is what's really mm. frustrating so many people talk about the right the shift from like the bi the bureau of investigation to the fbi from the general intelligence division etc but so few mm. people focus on the garvey movement and how deport deporting marcus garvey and was so important to the rise right. of j edgar hoover but also the established the establishment of the radical division but also um counterintelligence because garvey like mm. using black informants and black sort of counterintelligence agencies was really they did not do that in many organizations right. even even those um even the communist and socialist organizations like in terms of infiltration and surveillance because J. Edgar Hoover was racist and a bitch, like he reserved those tactics specifically for, for black organizations, right? right? right. And so like Garveyism right. is so important for the the, right. the development of like the counterintelligence network. But anyway. No, but no, but that's that's but that, and that, and that's bag of wire, right? It's bag of wire mm -hmm. dead dude. And so I, I mean I, I didn't say this earlier. There's two, but the there's song, two black ones. Mm. But no, bag of wire becomes not a dude. 
Black Alliance, <laughs> like the the infrastructure of it, like the like those individuals. So by the time in 1970, the song "Out of Bag of Wire," "Out of Pistol," "Bag of Wire" gas shot is saying informants. Like when Marley says Ross and I work for the CIA or DEA, like that's a that's an extension of Bag of Wire should get shot. So by the 90s, when you got all these dancers so on some are killing formers, that's part of a tradition. That's a response to Garvey's surveillance. Like it's a long, it's a long, broader tradition that we're really talking about. That's gotta be unpacked. So that's why for me why Garvey is also important in that discussion. Can you speak a little bit about black power and how looking at Black power in the Black Pacific challenges some of the distortions of so-called Black power studies. And what, are, what is your perspective on that? I mean, you, we ain't got to get messy and gossipy. I know that too Black, much to his chagrin, he doesn't like to gossip, but like, what is your sense of Black power studies and how does your study of Black power in the Pacific maybe challenge or offer an alternative perspective? Well, I mean, you know, I talk about that um, to some extent in, in the intro to Palu's Diaspora. And, you know, from my in inception in terms of studying what Black power was always from a global perspective. And so I just think that as opposed to, I think that some scholarship tried to force uh, global narratives into a, not even just a US narrative, but a, a specific kind of US Black politics that pointed towards the presidency that some would say maybe minimizes radicalism. Um, from my perspective, if you look at Black power globally, you really can't do that because Black power globally is very much connected to decolonization, is always anti-imperialist. Uh, it's very much anti-capitalist. Uh, not that there aren't any other Black power elements. I mean, if you look at Forrest Burnham in Guyana and how he used Black power, um, you know, but, but that's, that's it, right? Like looking globally, you also could see how <clears throat> the use of Black power can be used to actually attack Black movements. So, you know, we should be, I'm very conscious of how we use Black power, even how we frame Black power studies, because the notion of Black power hasn't always been used to like support Black movements. It can be used to do just the opposite. Um, but I think by and large, Black power globally challenges, you know, ideas that connect Black power to US imperialism. Um, it's always not that. It's never supportive of Black US imperialism. It's not. Um, in terms of the, the Pacific, I think, I think some of the environmental considerations are, are important. Uh, for example, in Australia, the Black Panther Party was calling for land, but it wasn't new land, right? It was like return of our spiritual lands. And we didn't have to do anything on them. We just want them back. Like it doesn't have to be land for housing. We just want our lands, like stop mining on our lands. Like you can't do nuclear testing in our lands. Or in our waters. That was a that was a part of of of, of black power. Um, black power in the Oceania was also very much influenced by the Francophone black world. For France, Fanon is critical. Black power activists are organizing in Paris. Uh, they're being very much suppressed by the French. The French and the British are very much concerned of the spread of black power in Oceania, and they actively find ways to oppress the movement, the immigration controls. Uh, if you look at Black power in Oceania, we see political prisoners that we don't talk about. Like Duby Gorday was incarcerated several times. She's a, a leader of the Kanak struggle in New Caledonia. Um, there's severe repression consistently, but also there are victories, right? The, you know, I mentioned the delegation from Wanawatu who goes to Six Pack. They, you know, actually defeat the French and the British in 1980. Uh, and they saw themselves as being the Cuba of Oceania. And they also, you know, very much and very much, you know, I should say above the board, not, not, they're not, they're not, they're not even, how do I say it, uh, covert about it. They're very explicit. We're the Cuba of Oceania. Our independence doesn't mean anything if these other countries are still not free. So as in Garvey, I mean, sorry, as in, as in Nkrumah and Ghana, um, the political leader, Walter Linney, he was really close with, with Paolo uh, and his sister, Hilda Linney. Uh, he becomes a, very, a really vocal voice at the United Nations and other international spaces that are, one of watch is the first country to set up uh, the official residency in Harlem. Um, and that was very intentional. I uh, sort of very black. Um, 
the first uh, ambassador is, oh man, um, Van Lira, Robert Van Lira, um, Aluta Continua, who also edited uh, Return to the Source by Cabral. He becomes the first ambassador for Wanawatu, sort of very much interested or connected with African liberation struggles. Um, and the anti-apartheid movement is like the, you know, they also use their presidency as, well, he uses presidency as a moment to, you know, address anti-apartheid in South Africa. Uh, they spearhead what they call the Melanesian Spearhead Group, which was an international body which was designed to help other countries or political struggles like the Canaks in Caledonia, uh, you had folks in Tahiti, you had West Papua actually become independent. But these, for me, these are part of a broader sense of Black power politics. Uh, that if we if we compare that to the Black political leadership in the Caribbean, they were much more hesitant to embrace Black power politics um, once they become political leaders. Well, I mean, but this this is a difference because some of these leaders were didn't they didn't become leaders on the banner of Black power. They're already there. But by and large, Wanawatu seemed to, at least in the early 1980s, try to enact some of those Black power and pan-oceanic slash pan-African politics to try to make that really intentional or part of the structure, um, which I think was, was is a lot there for political theorists, for folks interested in Black politics globally. Uh, Wanawatu is an amazing, amazing space. I mean, it's colonized by the French and the British at the same time, literally. So I don't, I don't think that's an experience we really engage what that means in terms of a liberation struggle. When you say colonized at the same time, like literally is in like portions of the territories or like they're literally sharing like the British and the French are, I'm, cause I'm not, I don't know the, the nature. Yeah, of is it like the Cameroons or is it like Gambia yeah. in Senegal? <laughs> like no, what is that's, that's the, or like I'm thinking it's, like for the, the DR in Haiti, like what, you know. Mm -hmm. It's it's one land space. It's four different sets of laws. One's for French citizens one for British citizens, one for natives and a mixed court administered by a, a Spanish and Dutch judge. So they used to have jokes where if, if, a, if a British national was driving to see a French cop, he would speed up because the French cop can't stop him. Um, two governments that the French and the British would make joint decisions on how the country would be administered. Two different sets of education systems. Um, and each, each told nationalist movements that the other power was what was holding up independence. So they're going back and forth. The French saying it's the British. The British saying it's the French. The French want to kill everybody. The British want to keep folks alive so they can take the resources. It's like indirect and direct rule at the same exact time, which is for Wanawatu, Black internationalism was, was the answer. Like internationally, we need, we need international support because we're trapped. And um, yeah, they've, they've, they've been that battle. I mean, one of what you still, the lingering impacts of colonialism continue, but not, not they weren't, you know, not, not to the extent of other, other countries. So then that's actually an interesting segue into the, the last question, uh, the last big question that we have. Um, so you're very clearly, obviously situated, you, you are an African diaspora black study scholar, your work is situated that way, but the work that you're doing on the black Pacific, I think brings black studies and indigenous studies into interesting uh, conversations with one another. Um, but there's also ways that I think, even from what I, you know, sort of a cursory glance in the, in Pacifica black that, even indigenous studies as it pertains to sort of um, Aboriginal studies in Australia are, are still have very kind of contentious relationships with thinking about blackness, right? And even, I mean, I don't know, I think there are even interesting ways that African studies doesn't get thought of as indigenous studies in important ways. And so I'm interested just in your own perspective, um, you know what what's what is what's kind of at stake in thinking indigenous studies and black studies together through your work on the black pacific um and how does engaging indigenous studies help you think differently and perhaps more robustly about the study of black or african di black and african diasporic peoples i mean that, that's that's a great question um i've always found it curious that <laughs> african people when we're not considered indigenous i'm always like wait a minute what do you how can that be like, how can how can Africa not be considered indigenous? 
settler colonialism, bitch, Rhodesia, South exactly, Africa. Right? How can how like what do you what like like that makes no sense. Um, but I, I get I guess but I do get what does make sense is the the, the border fighting sometimes, um, which don't always make logical sense, quote unquote. But I think there's a lot at stake. You know, I think some people might feel like their their space is at stake. The intellectual space is at stake. Um, I do think that a Black Pacific helps us think some of this through because for for Aboriginal Australians, uh, one of the quotes that, of Dennis Walk is that we read "Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee" as much as we read the autobiography of Malcolm X. They didn't see a contradiction. We're black and we're indigenous. Like that's. But I mean, who is not black and indigenous? At least if we're talking about Africa, we're indigenous somewhere, right? You're indigenous somewhere. So I think that helped them walk through what we might see as boundaries. But I also think the, the one of the biggest things that black power and other national struggles had to work in Oceania was the European boundaries of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. And then Aborigines, who so Europeans said they don't even count. Like the Australian constitution says nobody was there, but the British got there. Like no humans, just plants. So from Darwin and the, the whole list, those, those hierarchies and they're very gendered. These are really difficult to walk the, through. The constitution still says that? I just, just wanted to be clear. The constitution has changed in 85. Okay. So almost 85 years. This, this term of terra nullis was there. And it's only taken away in this landmark court case. Um, but Aborigines aren't counted in the census until 1968, 69. And, and Aduru was, was, a big, was a big player in that moment. But so they're not even the census until the 60s. Um, yes, but I think, you know, looking at the anti-nuclear or the nuclear free Pacific movement, there's a lot that takes place in Oceania from indigenous persons who have been told you're Polynesian, you're Melanesian, you're Micronesian. And there are, hier there, 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 are, there are hierarchies of beauty and gender that have to be worked through. Like Tahiti is portrayed by Europeans as you heard the noble savage and the women are beautiful. If you get a postcard, it'll be a, a woman from Polynesia or probably a girl, scanty clothes on the beach. With long hair. Postcard from Wanawatu, cannibals. It's gonna be a bunch of dudes doing some type of, and I'm, I'm saying it, you know, quote unquote, the perception of this cannibal dangerous dance. And th those just gender, ungendered norms, they lasted for so long that the Black Palm movement and these other movements, these different various ethnic groups had to really work through. And so one of the things that I was I've been inspired or excited to see is that usually on the global stage, oceanic activists stand in for each other, whether the Maori, uh, you know, whether the, the other kind of Pacifica peoples, there's usually the stand in. So when people like Barack Sope, who's at Six Pack, his reference in the political struggles of all Oceania, anti-nuclear testing, uh, you know, that, that's like a consistent thing that I see. And, and you know, maybe we can interrogate the, the levels of that solidarity, but I think for me, it's been interesting. Also interesting from the standpoint of, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop with this, the notion of the Islander, with someone like myself from Bermuda, um, who's always seen myself as an island person, uh, but when we really unpack it, Black folks have been in Bermuda for about 400, 500 years. We may have come from island backgrounds in Africa, but, for the most part, probably not, right? Well, we may come from river systems, but we may not come from ocean system. There's a reason why we still call on our ancestors out of Africa, Aye Moya, right? Ocean for the ocean, as opposed to indigenous oceanic or indigenous Atlantic detas from this, the water spaces. Go to Oceania, folks have been in Wanawatu and Southern Islands for thousands of years. I mean, 30,000 years plus. So they still speak of indigenous deities of those waters. It's like these island communities. And so to the extent that the Caribbean, in terms of a black Caribbean, 
is still becoming an island societies. There's a lot there in, in, in Oceania. There are certain oceanic civilizations, quote unquote, and I hate that term, so cultures rather, uh, societies that are probably older by name than certain African societies that we define as being distinctly or definitively African. So if we think about an African diaspora that could have migrated out of Africa willingly, voluntarily, and still develop African culture without Europeans, at what point does, do these people stop becoming African people? Like, what is the African diaspora? Is it how, how we were taken out of Africa? Are we African diaspora because we were forcibly taken? And those who were not forcibly are not part of a diaspora? Is it which direction we went? How long we were when we got to a place? Uh, and this is why, to, to bring it back, Black International does work for me in Oceania. Because while we're still trying to figure out you know, the migration routes and who identifies with Africa and where and when and how, the question of Blackness is not a, really a question in Oceania. Like the, the Blackness, is, it's been there long enough where there's an understood, there's, a, there's a body of knowledge around what it means to be Black. And there was an a, a activist named, um, um, uh, oh man, the Prime Minister, the former Permanent Secretary, Summer Islands, in 1970, had this major quote at a, at a major conference, but he said it a lot. The problem with Solomon Islanders is, is, is not that uh, we're not black enough, is that we're too black for the world. And that was gonna be the title of my book, to be honest, too black for the world. Because across the world, folks are having debates about are these folks black enough? No, no, they're not black, they're indigenous. So they're not this, they're not that. His response was now nah, the problem is that we're too black. Like our blackness is so, is so older, but our blackness is older than colonialism. We were here before Europe was founded. So where do we fit? You want us to identify with a, a, a process that doesn't match our experience? We're still black though. You can't take that from me. But in that sense, the black, the black and black internationalism really makes sense even more in that context because yes and no, maybe this is a, you know, a diasporic migration from the continent, right. maybe not. But so, it, I mean, it, and it makes sense even in the kind of way that we've come to understand the, the term black politically in the way right. that it is used in South Africa, the way that it's used in Europe, um, that is not only for, for people that are, you know, known direct descendants, at, you know, even if it's not close of the continent of Africa versus other people that might include East Indians and you know other types of people so i mean i can i can see the purchase um purchase of black of black internationalism in that in that way um in a critical way um that might somehow be qualitatively different from diaspora or pan-africanism in that sense yeah. yeah i mean i think you know that's why part of what i wrote a thing about the relationship between black internationalism and diaspora and i just settled on black internationalism as the the sort of communist or socialist adjacent iteration of pan-africanism because for me all pan-africanism is not radical in that sense right some pan-african so pan-africanism it runs spans the ideological gamut but there's something always anti i don't know so anyway that's just sort of how i try one way i try to make sense of the relationship between black internationalism and pan-africanism but i think that to your point what's important about the what is essential about political blackness? And I'm ambivalent about that shit because it gets per perilously close to transracial in, in our space, right? Which is some motherfucking bullshit. But I think it's the deep engagement with the political and with the sort of anti-imperialism and the anti-colonialism and the, the cross-pollinization, if you will, of the black, of black struggles and literally African descendant struggles taken up by peoples who are using those as sort of tools within their own struggles. So I think that there, that, that political blackness, it has to be that like, there has to be that rootedness, right? And um, I guess a question that I'm trying to think about is like, African, Amer there's this whole African-American and I mean that just at, to specify an ethnicity, not because I'm African-American because I'm black, but anyway, like what is the role of the, of US black and all of this right because on the one hand we're like we need to decenter that it's not the be-all end-all but on the other hand if we think about 
USGIs and their impact on, on a lot of the sort of consciousness raising around blackness, especially during World War II. If we think about the long history of like eight historically black colleges and universities and black American intellectuals and the way that they're circulating, I just wonder, on the one hand, I do think we need to sort of decenter the US, but on the other hand, like how do we do that and still attend to the very deep importance of like US black thinkers and also the United States, the black US as like a route in black internationalism. No, I, I think I think you said it. It's a route, right? It's a route. I mean, you can't you can't just make invisible millions of black people <laughs> and mm -hmm. act like, you know what I mean? Millions of black people aren't important, right? Like like the numbers themselves like speak to it, but even beyond the other networks of of US imperialism, right? That allow the the, the visibility of those numbers on a, a larger scale than other black populations, but it's a route and, 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 and um, there are other routes, mm -hmm. you know, there are, there are other routes. Like Sydney is the site of black internationalism. We know Paris is, I would, I would argue that Hamilton Bermuda is the site of black internationalism. Maybe, and, and these are also with degrees. One of the things I tried to get at in Paulo's diaspora was the notion of mobile metropoles where, mm -hmm. you know, when we look at, our metropoles aren't always structural and don't always last forever, like maroon communities. But we can't say they don't, they don't have some impact when they do exist, or even the memories of these spaces have impact beyond the actual physical life. So I think there are other, there are other routes, right? There are, other, there are other cities. I mean, there are other cities, I think even within the United States, certain spaces are prioritized and others aren't, right? Is everything Harlem in New York when we think of black folks? Um, yes. What about New Jersey? What about it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, There's newer. I'm gonna, no, okay, I'm, gonna, so I'm gonna say I'm gonna say I'm gonna say I'm gonna say one. I'm gonna say one. I'm gonna say the Fugees and, and come back to that when the next book drops. When the next I book guess. drops, I'll come back because Fugees is the song system. But that's a whole nother discussion. I'm not. So that is interesting. It. Um, Peter James Hudson is writing about hmm. George Padmore, and he okay. talks and he talks about Nashville. Nashville like when we right. think about Nashville we think about Dolly Parton and like you know country music but like isn't she yeah but Nashville is like this sort of global metropolitan space in the way that he think he conceives of it and thinking about the development the sort of intellectual and political development of George Padmore so I think the idea of mobile mobile metropoles is so that's that's the bomb You've already mentioned your your forthcoming projects so but do you want to briefly uh talk about like what you have next for us for our final our final question yeah um so i'm really looking at like the long 1990s as a moment of black insurgency and global mm -hmm. black crisis which i think is not we don't interrogate that enough i think as a moment of, of crisis and for the black world and our response to it right the, the 90s includes apartheid and the fall of apartheid and Mandela's presidency and, and, and contradictions around that, right? It's, it's OJ trial. It's, it's Hurricane Hugo in the Caribbean. It's our Rwanda, right? The, the Civil War. It's, um, it's, it's Brazil's defeat of Italy in World Cup. Um, it's, it's September 11th. It's all these like massive major moments. It's the Rodney King. For Aristide. Amadou Diallo, Aristide, exactly. So the project is about how sound system culture, by that I mean reggae and dance, so engage those moments. And so the story is about this insurgent 1990s told through dance on reggae. Uh, so September 11th's impact on immigration in the Caribbean is captured in the music. And so the music is just this amazing archive of black insurgency in the era. And that's that's the next project. And I'm co-writing it with my with my, uh, my co-author is his name is DJ Morton. My co-author. I was getting ready to say something nice mm. until you came with that foolishness. Um, <laughs> but this this the project. Okay. No, you know what? This is the project you've been waiting your whole life for that you so much so that you got two personalities to do it. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you know, whenever the world meets DJ No Time, then they'll know what I'm talking That's about. That's not right. That's not right. <laughs> That's not right. 
so keto dr swan thank you so much for being here today it's been so wonderful to have a wide ranging and insightful and hilarious and brilliant discussion so we hope to have you back again soon and um can people find you anywhere social media you out here i'm out there i'm, I'm on twitter um uh so yeah i think it's keto swan so holla all right um, thank you at, at, at uh, more time on uh instagram so you can find me <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you y'all take care it's been a pleasure all right, all right. Bye. bye bye Peace. And that's our show for this very special episode. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you were here with us. So thanks for tuning in. I'm Dr. Layla Brown here with my girl, Dr. CBS. And thanks as always to Two Black in the Back. And we are signing off. Peace.